Hi, my name is Massimo Referre. I'm a technical product manager uh, with the Cloud Native Application Business Unit at VMware. Uh, what I would like to talk about in the next um, few minutes in this short presentation is a very high level introduction to containers. Right? And the title of this session is, in fact, Container 101. So, very basic information about containers. Uh, before we start, um, it, it's funny to mention that containers per se do not exist. Right? If you think about Linux, um, there isn't a, really a, a, a container first class citizen object uh, inside the operating system. Whenever we talk and refer to the word containers, what we basically mean is a collection of operating system um, technologies like C groups and namespaces and layer five system that collectively allows you to implement, you being the end user, this concept of a container, right? So what a container is, is basically um, an aggregation of these different technologies that exist in the operating system that allows you to run an application, uh, usually a single process, uh, inside a, an operating system, right? So if we, if we take an operating system uh, like Linux, for example, and Windows has been introducing containers um, more recently, containers lives inside this operating system as, as objects uh, that are defined by those technologies that I referred to. What I'm not going to discuss in this uh, brief presentation is the, um, is the layout model of that operating system. So everything that you will see here um, is, is true for both operating system running on bare metal, directly on the hardware or on top of an hypervisor. Whether you run those containers in an operating system on an hypervisor or on bare metal is a totally orthogonal discussion that we're not going to touch uh, in this presentation. There are merits and, and, and reasons for which you may want to run it on top of an hypervisor, but we're not going to touch them. So back to this uh, role and, and notion of containers. So. Um, Basically, as I alluded to, containers has been around for um, a number of years, but only in the last three, four years, we have seen a surge in the adoption of this uh, concept and underlying technology. And the reason for that is because up until Docker came out and the technology that they have built, um, it was very, very difficult and surely not for the masses uh, to be able to run containers, uh, particularly at scale, in a very efficient way. So what Docker did is basically they introduced a technology, a software technology, that made the consumption uh, of the notion of containers much easier, uh, pretty much for everyone. So Docker is, and, and the entire container ecosystem is exploding in terms of complexity. But whenever I do a one-on-one -on -one talk about containers and Docker, I usually start from the beginning and the atomic, um, and the atomic functions that Docker introduced to make containers um, easy, easy to consume. There are four, in my opinion, four very important atomic um, uh, operations that made Docker so widely used. They are the build, the push, the pull, and the run. These are the four critical operations that you as a, as a user can do on a Docker host that I'm representing here to manage containers. Right? So let's start with the build process. So the build process is really very much the process that um, takes you from defining what that container is going to um, include in terms of the stack that that container is going to represent, um, all the way to building a, what we refer to as a Docker image, right? So basically the idea is that you start with the so-called Docker file, which is basically a list of instruction that are 
a codified version of what you would do to um, basically package your application. So think about being able to say, I want to use a particular OS version, that is usually the, the very first statement uh, inside the Docker file, and then you go through um, a number of um, typically shell instructions uh, that basically add all the dependencies that your application needs and your application, so you move your application inside the context um, of this Docker image. And to make a long story short, basically what happens is that when you launch a build against this Docker file, the end result is that this produces what we call a Docker image, right? Once you have a Docker image, and imagine that you are running on your personal laptop or um, a single instance of an operating system where Docker is running, Docker being a set of binary that are running inside this operating system, what you can do at that point is basically you can instantiate that Docker image as a container inside this operating system. So basically, this is what the run command allows you to do. So Basically, when you run, when you do a run command against this Docker image, the end result is that you are actually instantiating a container inside this operating system, right? So this container would pretty much be that uh, sandbox that I was drawing um, up there, right? There are a couple of additional uh, atomic and very important operations like pull, push, and pull that allows you to move that image around into so-called um, uh, registries or Docker-compatible registries. But this is not something that we're going to cover in this very um, uh, basic um, overview. I'm going to shoot another video where I'm going to talk specifically about um, the registries. Right? The other thing that is important to understand here and again, I'm just touching some of the concepts at the very high level, is that the way that you manage this um, container at this point is not like you would manage a traditional virtual machine, right? So um, a traditional virtual machine has a, you know, a, a very lean networking model where you connect this, um, this entity onto a network and it will get an IP address and everything. Um, is working fine. Similarly for storage, virtual machine usually has persistent storage uh, by default, so you can move them around and you can persist the data that are um, in, those virtual, uh, in those virtual machines. With containers, this is very different, right? So for example, the networking model, particularly in the Docker context, is such that this um, container has an internal IP address that only exists inside uh, this um, operating system, and the way that this container gets to the outside world is through a number of NAT rules that exist inside this Docker image, right? So either from going out um, or going in. The other important thing to remember is that containers are ephemeral by definition, right? So when you deploy a container, that container has storage associated that is ephemeral. So if you save a file inside that container um, and for some reason you destroy that container and you restart um, another container, uh, maybe because you are updating your application through a new Docker image, uh, you're going to lose that content. Right? So there is a concept in Docker that is um, external volume or persistent volume. Uh, that basically allows you to decouple the container, the ephemeral part of the container from where you want to persist data. Right? So imagine that you have a new version of your application, um, uh, you update the Docker file um, uh, to point to the new uh, application, um, uh, you rebuild that Docker image uh, so that you have a new version of the image that represents your new version of the application. And the way that it works with containers is that you do not update the containers at runtime. The way that you manage um, containers and application running in containers is that you destroy this container and you recreate a new container starting from the new version 
um, of, the, of the Docker image that you just created. So that's why it is important to understand very well the relationship between the persistency of the container and the known persistency part um, of the container. The last thing um, that I want to mention, and this pretty much covers uh, like the basics um, of, of, um, um, of how containers work um, on top of an, ap on a, on a, on a, an operating system. Um, the, the other thing that I want to mention is that this is usually the scenario that you, um, that you would uh, get to into if you are uh, on your laptop, for example. But as you move into a more production environment, you're probably not going to run on a single uh, instance of this operating system. You're probably going to run um, on top of other um, uh, instances of the operating system um, that had doc Docker deployed on. And because of this scheduling problem, because this now becomes a cluster where you are scheduling your containers, and because of managing all of these networking and storage um, 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 concept that we have just uh, discussed, we have seen a surge um, in the last few years of container orchestration framework. Right? So everything that we have discussed here is very, very much a uh, basic Docker uh, concept, but as it gets into production, as it gets at scale, uh, you will start to see and hear terms like, for example, Swarm or Kubernetes. which are basically technology that are used to manipulate uh, a number of different um, 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 Docker hosts, as you can see here, and manipulate some of the complexity around networking and storage. So basically, these are concepts that allow, and technologies that allows you to treat this as a single entity and basically do all of those operations um, in an automated way. Thanks for watching.